So tell me what what began this project. Um, well, it really goes back to an event called Strong Angel, uh, which is run by uh, directed by uh, Commander Eric Rasmussen, who's um, I can't remember his specific title. I think he heads up the Naval, Medi uh, the Naval Medical Center. So Eric became extremely interested in refugee issues after one of his bosses said, Eric, go learn about this. So Eric held an event called Strong Angel in Hawaii first, Strong Angel 1 and 2, where they did a simulated disaster. They had a bunch of people in refugee tentage, and they just tried to sort of run a disaster and observe what was going on, learn from the experience, and figure out how they could improve disaster response capabilities. Um, what came out of that was a meeting called the Sustainable Settlements Charette at the Rocky Mountain Institute, where they got about 40 people together in an environmental think tank setting and said, what do we do with refugees? How do we make this work better? And what came out of that was a specification. And the specification was, what we need is a high quality shelter that lasts a long time and is cheap and can be transported with the refugees. And this is really critical. Um, one of the reasons that host countries tend not to want to accept refugees is once you have a refugee camp, it's really hard to relocate the refugees back home again because they build a life there, they build infrastructure there, they build homes there, and you can't resettle them without driving them out of their homes. So the idea was to design a shelter where you could house the refugees comfortably, but when the time came to move them, you could take the shelters down, ship them by truck, and then put them back up again for the refugees in their native villages once they were free to go home. So that was the specification. Um, the other part of the puzzle was a thing we called distributed infrastructure, which is providing all the basic services of life without requiring what we call pipe and wire harness. So if you look at one of these buildings around here, every one of them has electricity running into the building, clean water running into the building, sewage running out of the building, and many have natural gas lines, have telephone lines, and the combined cost of all of those additional services can equal the cost of the building itself. So when you put these two threads together, what you get is a requirement for a building which you can transport easily and which also comes with a complete infrastructure harness that's self-contained. Because if you're in a refugee camp, you dug sewers for every building. When you move the buildings, the refugees would have lost their sewerage. If you did the same thing with electricity, if you had like a big you know, 50 kilowatt generator in the center of camp, when you sent the refugees home again, they'd have lost their power. So everything has to be self-contained at this sort of family level um, structure, and that's basically why this building is the way that it is. Um, when you need to take it down again, you just cut the tape with a craft knife, and the whole thing goes back into a single panel, four feet by eight feet by about a foot for the US dimensions, or whatever the equivalent is in meters, it's probably, oh, I don't know, 36 centimeters by uh, 60 by 120. And, um, again, I know we well, in the refugee camp context, these things are kind of expensive. We're still talking about 50 to 100 dollars per refugee, and uh, typically refugee camp costs are 5, 10, 15 dollars per head. So these kind of things are not designed for your typical refugee scenario. This is really looking for a new approach to handling refugees, which acknowledges that your average refugee is a refugee for 17 years. So because people are in the field for so long, um, if you start paying more of those costs up front, you can build them proper infrastructure initially, and then pay less later on as you have to send out generation after generation after generation of tents and additional equipment. Uh, in terms of bearing the cost, what we're hoping to do is create an open source design pool. So we'll do all of the designs, put them into the public domain, find low cost uh, bulk distribution points, and then whichever government is paying for that group of refugees can just buy those technologies off the shelf from whichever vendor they like. Uh, right now the US government is footing the bulk of the development costs, but uh, I work remarkably cheaply, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, you know, even if I don't get paid, the work continues. So it's a really very kind of guerrilla effort. And um, what do you hope to see uh, comes out of this project? Well, refugees are a relatively small population. It's about 9 to 10 million people. And although they have the worst living conditions in the world, there are many more people who are living in poverty than are actually refugees. So what I'd like to see is an approach to doing housing for villages and slums, which draws on these kind of techniques and these kind of technologies, but scales through uh, straightforward commerce.
If people want solar powered lights and they cost five or ten dollars a piece, they'll buy them. If they want wood gasification stoves and it costs twenty dollars a piece, they'll buy them. So by developing these technologies kind of under the umbrella of the US government, but making sure that they can go into mass production without high patent fees and these kind of things, what we hope to do in the long run is change the available technology in the developing world. And I think that that approach offers a lot of environmental benefits, it offers a lot of health benefits, it offers a lot of humanitarian benefits, without having much of an upfront cost. I'm going to stop you, because I like what you just said, change the change something for the developing, wor developing world. Yes. And you've shifted. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's okay. So I just want you to say it again, because we might use it. Yes. A little right there. And okay. And say that line again, how it's... Yeah. How you hope to change. So what we want to do is change the uh, available technologies for the developing world so that they have good solutions that they can buy for five, 10, 15, 20 dollars. And what we're trusting is that the free market will take care of both resource availability, so people will see there's a profit to be made designing these things and selling them, but also resource reach. Like the fact that you can buy a Coca-Cola almost anywhere on the planet is really important. It means that when people want a product, they're capable of building a distribution network to carry it. So if a solar lighting system or a stove system becomes as important as Coca-Cola is to people, they're going to make sure that it becomes available all over the world. You know, there's this myth that these things are hard to export or hard to distribute, but they're not. As long as it's a single self-contained package, you can make those things available all over the place just by publishing the design. And gradually, gradually, if people want it, they'll buy it and they'll buy it and they'll buy it and it'll gradually spread. And you can see this with cell phones. I mean, cell phones have gone global maybe 10 years, just because they were useful. So if we think of it as trying to make something that's as useful as Coca-Cola or as useful as a cell phone, but solves basic human building problems, I think we'll do quite well. And what is the initial cost to make one of these structures? Um, for demo purposes, we make them out of temporary materials. So US prices building this size is about $200. And what different sizes do you have for uh, these? Uh, the smallest one is one quarter of this floor space, so it's 42 square feet, and it's about six feet high, and it's big enough for just about two people. And there are four sizes from that to one which is larger than this, so it's 12 feet high, 166 square feet. Uh, you can also extend them and cluster them, because they have a hexagonal base. You can put three or four of them together, and they fit precisely, and then you cut doors that go straight through from one building to another. Well, um, there are two factors. The first is that the military communicators are often first on the scene with the engineers. So um, they're the people who are going to be initially facing a population if there is a disaster. And by making sure that they understand that these kind of options are available, it makes it possible for them to request the materials to be sent out, to teach people locally how to do the construction. So they're, it's sort of a first population to make aware of the fact that these options are there. <coughs> uh, the second thing is that European Command is in the process of standing up Africa Command. And we think that Africa Command is a place which has got much more of a direct need for these kind of building options. If you're dealing with displaced populations, if you're dealing with poverty, uh, even if you just need a cool, dust-free environment for a radio rig, these kind of improvised building solutions have a lot to offer. And um, have you spoken to anybody here to find a number about these? Have you really been talking to any of the Dell chiefs and people about what it is that you're doing? Uh, no. We ha we're scheduling a briefing later on in the week. But until we actually had the buildings up, there's very little to talk about. Okay. Once you actually have the building, then mostly it comes down to word of mouth and foot traffic. And, you know, have you seen that shiny hut over there? <laughs> They're telling a crazy story about infrastructure. And that's really, I mean, the core approach. It's very much show and tell. Um, because really, until you see it, nobody would believe it. You know, you're building a building out of polystyrene and cardboard and duct tape? You don't know. Okay. And um, where, uh, where can people find more information? about this and about the project and what it is that you're doing? Um, if you type Hexiart into Google, H-E-X-A-Y-U-R-T, you'll find a variety of resources online. Uh, there are videos on YouTube which show construction. 
Uh, there's a website called apropedia.org, which is, a, is an appropriate technology development wiki. Uh, there's also infosharehub.org, which is where we're putting together a field manual documenting this and the whole distributed infrastructure picture as part of the IPP project. What is Apropedia? Uh, Apropedia is an appropriate technology wikipedia. So it's a bunch of, bunch of people working together to try and develop a library of appropriate technology resources, which is licensed in such a way that anybody can use them. And they're talking about water purification, stoves, uh, environmental best practices, all of that kind of stuff. Is there anything else you'd like to add about your project or um, what else that you're doing that's working on right now? Um, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about the infrastructure package. Because this in itself is just a building. So if you put 100,000 of these on a piece of land, immediately you're going to wind up with terrible infrastructure field. You won't be able to get clean water, you won't have sewage problems, you'll wind up with disease, a lot of people will die. So the building in itself is really nothing. The important part is that it ships with infrastructure. So we have an approach to electrical lighting for about $20 a house, where you take a single solar panel per village, connected to a AA battery charger, and people just come, charge their batteries at the charger, take them home and plug them into a fluorescent light fixture. And a 7 watt bulb will run for about uh, 12 hours on 4 AA, so it's two days worth of light. Very, very low cost. Um, for water, water sterilization, there's a thing called the solar water pasteurizer, which is basically a plastic bottle and some tinfoil. And that will sterilize drinking water under almost any condition, so we render it non-pathogenic. Uh, similar approaches for uh, cooking, there's this thing we call wood gasification stove, burns wood ten times more efficiently than a regular stove, that gets you heating into the mix. Uh, composting toilets, we're working with some people to try and design an extremely low cost composting toilet. And what you wind up with there is something like a porta potty that simply never needs to be emptied. And they just run forever and all they produce is compost that you can just park on the edge of town until it degrades all the way into soil. Um, and these are I mean, revolutionary approaches. It means that you can get a high standard of living um, without having these big centralized plants that are so expensive and so difficult to protect and maintain. And this is the real hope. That when we talk about building resilience in societies, when you have a disaster, if you roll out systems that just work and keep working, you don't have this problem that when you go home, everything you built collapses. And I think that's really our key uh, take home here. We want to build systems which, once they're installed, run forever. Uh, no, I can't think of anything. Okay. <laughs> uh, it'd be nice if we could. We're just going to get started uh, right now. Uh, if you could just state your name. Okay. Where you're from. Okay. And where you're from. Ah, my official title, too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Bob Vertis, and it's spelled V R T I S. And I am a contractor working in support of OSD NII, OSD, the Office of the Secretary of Defense for Networks and Integrated Information. And how are you uh, directly related to the Hexier project? Ah, I was given the task of bringing Mr. Gupta here to uh, Combined Endeavor uh, to help him integrate into the exercise and be able to demonstrate uh, how the, the Hexier uh, uh, to 44 different nations. Uh, how easy it is to build uh, and how useful it might be in support of people that are in crisis and need shelter quickly. And is this your first time working with Mr. Gupta? Yeah, I met him on the internet and uh, we've had a couple of telephone conversations, but the first time we've actually met face to face. And um, why is it that you're The, uh, I often ask myself the qu same question. Uh, Mr. Gupta was actually able to get the attention of uh, Dr. Lynn Wells, uh, who is the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for NII, for Networks and Integrated Information, uh, explained the concept to him and some of the other concepts about how you bring uh, a distributed infrastructure to people uh, who don't have much money or uh, nor much of an infrastructure to support them in the first place. And that might be as a result of a disaster, might be as a result of just uh, their normal living conditions. Uh, it fits in the sense that uh, when you go out and respond to a crisis, a lot of times the first people on site are the communicators. Uh, they're the ones that are out there setting up the communications so that the main portion of the response force will be able to talk back to the home base and be able to relay requests for support. 
Uh, so a lot of times those guys are the ones that are out there seeing a lot of the needs. Uh, and this is a good way to get and share information on a technique that can be used to bring something uh, to people in crisis. Uh, bring a roof over their heads and some initial safety and, and protection and some shelter without having to impact military operations. I don't have to give up one of my tents uh, to have a family live in. I can continue to use that as a command and control structure and we can take something like the hexier and that becomes a home for a family uh, at a cost of only $200 as opposed to the cost of a military GP small. Okay. And so what have you learned um, about the project at large that you feel is important um, for uh, just the world, the military, um, the communication? Uh, just trying to put this in, uh, do this as an implementation elsewhere in the world. Uh, we've done this before in the States. Uh, we've been able to take hexiurts out and been able to put them up, just go down to the Home Depot, uh, order some tape online. Uh, the logistics of getting that together and making that happen in Germany were different. Uh, the building materials are slightly different. Uh, the tape was a little bit more difficult to have. Uh, but once you're able to sort that out, uh, the concepts for construction were simple enough to translate it well, uh, and we were able to get a fire team of about five German soldiers well trained on putting up a hexi yurt in about two hours. Great. And so as you continue to implement this around the world, what other The challenges are, are, are really kind of uh, what makes this of value to people in crisis? What makes them want to have this as a home uh, instead of if, they, if they're used to living in the slums, the cardboard and the plywood that they normally construct their homes from? What will, what will make them want to have this as a better infrastructure? Uh, and, and will make this whole concept that much easier to, to kind of bring a little bit more stability uh, to people in crisis, uh, to people on the move. And so, how, how is it that y'all are marketing this to people? How are, is it that the taxier it really is better than what they're living in now? Uh, that's difficult. I um, mean, right now it's it's uh, very much like the uh, I guess the best characterization is the, li the Linux operating system. It's kind of like shareware software. Uh, somebody comes up with the idea on it. Uh, talk, they tell two friends, they tell two friends, and you begin to refine the concept and, and, and do this. So we're hoping to create a community of in, that's interested in using this, of people who typically respond to crisis situations, whether they be military or non-governmental organizations, so they can discuss techniques for how, uh, how this can be done uh, and, and share lessons learned. Uh, when I get back to the States, I'll be blogging on, on what it is that Benet and I did here uh, some of the lessons that we learned, come up with a full bill of material, and hopefully use some of your video uh, to demonstrate the techniques that we were able to use and what worked well. Uh, and then, in, a, in kind of a Wikipedia fashion, uh, looking for people to, to fix our mistakes, uh, to add additional concepts to that so that we get information shared around. And working in the military, I'm sure you've seen a lot of ideas proposed for uh, making things better and constantly coming up with new humanitarian missions. Um, it doesn't try and answer, it doesn't try and be something for everyone everywhere in one, in, in one instance. We're not waiting on the concept so that it works not only in the Arctic but also in the desert. This is a concept that will work, it work better in some areas of the world rather than others. Uh, and so we're trying to get it out there in, in, uh, in software we, we build a little, fix a little, build a little, fix a little. It's the same kind of concept here. Uh, if it makes sense to, to, to use this uh, in a humanitarian assistance uh, mission uh, that we come across, great. We hope that we get the lessons learned back from that so that we can continue to improve on it as well. And um, can you tell me about some of the, the politics of this? How, how is the U.S. government going to use this to, to help us? Our own country, other countries. Um, do you know what they're uh, focused on? There's, there's not a formal movement at this at, at, at this stage. Uh, I, I guess, kind of going back to one of your your earlier question, what makes this different? Nobody's trying to sell anybody anything on this one. 
We're introducing the concept and we're, and, and we're introducing the, the, the capability and the context that it would be useful in. Uh, this may be just as useful in humanitarian assistance as it would be to have to take along uh, to the slums of Rio de Janeiro and introduce down there as uh, a, the Home Depot of Brazil, a uh, quick way of building houses down there uh, for a population that doesn't have a lot of money uh, and it's housing that, that doesn't cost a lot of money to have. Uh, so introducing that concept as well. Is the U.S. government uh, formally behind this? No, not at this stage, but this, this kind of fits a niche of uh, you know, we're, the, we're, we're, we're taking oh, close, pretty close to half of the taxpayers' dollars. Uh, we are expected to respond to crises. Our, our nation, our, our people want us to do that kind of work. Uh, we need to be able to have options and have choices for doing that efficiently and smartly uh, and, and with our partners and with other nations as well. We don't, the U.S. doesn't have to be the first one to use this in a crisis response. Uh, we've got a fire team of Germans trained now. Uh, they may very well be the first ones to use this in a crisis. Okay, and do you think that if more Americans knew about this system and about the project and, and the benefits of it, do you think that more of them would be more supportive in getting the U.S. to back it and to really get on board with it? I'm, I'm going to be interested to see how it develops. Um, you know, uh, Vinay, Mr. Gupta and I uh, were talking, uh, uh, there's a movement to bring this to the Burning Man Festival uh, in California uh, as, a, as an expedient structure to, that goes up, and, which is, I guess, an arts festival uh, is about probably the best way to characterize it. Uh, okay. <laughs> I got that wrong, I'm sure. No, no, it's, it's an arts an, festival. It's an arts festival formally, but it's uh, kind of a different one. Uh, not one necessarily that the DOD gets exposed to that often. Uh, and the, uh, just to kind of get an idea of how it's going. Uh, and it would be nice to see where this takes off and goes to.